Hello Arts 234 students, uh, welcome to the very basics of Maya. Uh, we are going to learn the layout of Maya, how to use some of the basic Maya tools, uh, how to select the menu sets within Maya. We're going to learn the workspace and how it shows three-dimensional space, uh, how to create a three-dimensional object, and how to save your work. At this time, I'm going to play the one-minute startup movies, which will show you the basic skills and tips to get started in Maya, one at a time. To see objects close up, press F. To tumble or spin the view, hold the Option or Alt key and drag with the left mouse button. To track or pan the view, Hold the Option or Alt key and drag with the middle mouse button. To dolly or zoom the view, hold the Option or Alt key and drag with the right mouse button. The next movie shows you how to move, rotate, and scale. It is sometimes easier to work if you can see your objects from many points of view. The default is a single perspective view. To see four views, tap the space bar. The top, front, and side views are orthographic views. The tools that change the position, size, and rotation of objects are here. The manipulators are Move, Rotate, and Scale. The three colors on each manipulator correspond to the three axes. The x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. To constrain in one direction, drag a handle. To move an object freely or scale uniformly, drag the central handle. You can act on a single object, on many objects, or on parts of objects, which are called components. The next movie shows you how to create and view objects. You can make nerves and polygonal objects. Polygons are made of faces put together. Each face is flat. Nerves are made of curves and are smooth. Select either Nerves Primitives or Polygon Primitives from the Create menu and select a shape. Click and drag to create the shape. The channel box displays information for an object. The transform attributes, such as position and scale, are at the top. To view the shape attributes, such as radius, click on the word under Inputs. To switch between object displays, click any of these buttons in the panel toolbar. You can control how smooth objects look in the view with the keys 1, 2, and 3. This doesn't change the real shape of the object. The next movie shows you how to select and work with parts of objects called components. In Maya, Menus are grouped into menu sets. The first menu set you see is Animation. To see more features, change the menu set to Polygons, 
Surfaces, Dynamics, or Rendering by selecting from the list. There are menus with actions for each panel and window. For menu options, select the box at the right of the menu. Adjust the settings and then click the Apply and Close button. To see a marking menu, press and hold over the top of the object with the right mouse button. The marking menu items change depending on what you click on to let you quickly access common commands for that object. To display the hotbox, press and hold the spacebar. The hotbox is an advanced method to get to menus quickly. It is a customizable collection of menu sets and marking menus. The next movie shows you simple keyframe animation skills. Use the time slider to control an animation. To animate an object or attribute, first select the item and then press S to set a keyframe. The keyframe appears in the time slider. To change the current frame, click another frame number in the time slider using the left mouse button. Then move rotate or scale the object and press S to set another keyframe. Repeat these steps to set as many keys as you need. Use the time slider to change the frame then change the object attributes and then press S. Press play on the time slider playback controls to play back a looping animation. Press stop to end it. The next movie shows you how to change the look of an object and preview render it. To see shaded objects, click this button in the panel toolbar. To change the look of an object, Press and hold over the object using the right mouse button to view the marking menu and select Assign New Material. Select a material from this list. The Attribute Editor appears. These swatches let you adjust material attributes such as color. Click the swatch for the color attribute. Adjust the color, then move your cursor off the color chooser to exit. To see the list of textures, click the Map button. Select one of the textures to apply it to the material. To see the texture on the object, click this button in the Panel Toolbar. The panel toolbar contains other buttons to toggle lights and shadows on and off in the scene view. To render the current frame, click this button. The default quality provides a quick preview. Click this button to view the render settings window. Change the rendering type or adjust the render quality settings here and render again. See the help menu for more tutorials and information on all these topics. Um, to follow along in text, we're going to go to the D2L site. We're going to go to Content, and under Unit 1, Beginning Maya, um, I am currently showing the very basics that is this file right here. 
So I am going to be video demonstrating pretty much exactly what you see here. All right, so a couple things I want to get out of the way uh, right out of the gates is um, my cat is very dissatisfied with the service around here and he is demanding tuna, um, but that is not what I was having in mind exactly. So uh, what I actually wanted to say is um, if you're having some difficulty getting Maya to run or to install, um, like I said, go to the, sh the site that I showed on the intro video, um, click install or download on the student link, and it was being a little squirrely with me. Uh, it was not happy with um, with my login at first, but I just logged in a couple times and it eventually worked. Um, I think it wanted me logged in on a website at um, autodesk.com as, as my student account, and then it, it finally opened for me. So, um, well, for me, it's a teacher account, account. For you, it'll be a student account. Anyway, uh, it's the same. The, the license pretty much works the same way. So... Um, when you open Maya, um, you will see this. Uh, you will f maybe feel intimidated at first, um, especially if you read the Dear Future Student letters. Um, I don't want you to get too intimidated. Um, I will say that uh, Maya is definitely a beast, um, but I do have some good news. Uh, it is much more forgiving than it ever has been in the past. And um, if it does crash on you, uh, most of the time the crash recovery file will appear on the left. I haven't seen it so far fail to show up. So um, most of the time you won't lose your work. Now that it could be a problem in your scene, in which case um, you click the crash recovery file, it's going to open up and just crash again if that's the case. Um, but at any rate, I can uh, take a look at your scene files if you're having problems. Sometimes I can figure out what the problems are. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes it's just a mystery. Uh, and then we'll just chalk that up to Maya. So um, the what's new highlights, it doesn't really matter. You can leave it on or turn it off. What's new is irrelevant. You've never used Maya before, so what's new or old is neither here nor there for you. Um, so you can see here I'm logged in at, as my LCC address. <clears throat> so um, this is Maya. And right away we're going to see a few uh, different uh, commands that we can do right here. Um, if you got curious and started clicking on stuff, you'll see that some of these create objects. Um, and some of these are probably still a mystery at the moment. Um, this little bit of the interface right here is called the shelf. The shelf is there as a convenience and it is helpful in the sense that um, it just kind of puts a lot of these basic objects at your fingertips. Uh, it's not necessary. Everything that's there can be created um, from the create menu or accessed from other parts of the different menus. So if I if I click sphere right here or if I click create polygon sphere it does the same thing. So it's technically if this were gone it doesn't change anything that Maya does. So um, it's there as a convenience. Um, you can show or hide elements in the main window using the display UI elements. This is under, they might have moved that to, um, they might have moved that to preferences or something. It looks like they moved it in this version of Maya. So, um, and that was another thing I wanted to address actually out of the gates is uh, I am going to do this first tutorial on the basics on Maya 2020. Um, that might, may or may not be what you have. Uh, if it's not, there's sort of an expectation with 3D animation that you are going to be able to learn what the what the software is. You know, look it up as necessary. Don't be shy about using Google to find your um, different 
to find where the buttons are essentially. So uh, this is Maya 2020. It probably doesn't look that much different than your version, but if you do come across a tutorial that looks different, um, just be aware that as you progress, um, you might be expected to sort that out. So um, anyway, what I was saying is you can move these UI elements around. There's There used to be a display UI elements, but um, at any rate, the same thing can be accomplished by right-clicking on the little dotted line, that little double dotted line on those on those menus, and you can just arrange this however you want with the with the different windows that you use the most, and those will stay open. So, if you want to customize your workspace, definitely feel free. Um, all this stuff, you can see there's double dotted lines on each of these different pieces of the interface. All that stuff can be moved around. Uh, if you do end up moving something or hiding something that you are looking for later, you can always press spacebar and hold it down to get the hotbox menu, as they call it. So. Um, this brings up all the menus that are in Maya. As you can see, there's a lot of them. So if I wanted to get back to that Windows menu, that's right there in the Modify, Create, whatever it was I was doing. So, and then when I let the space bar up, it'll disappear. Uh, the menu sets are right here. And what these are, uh, Maya has different menu sets for um, different functions of the program. So they correspond to what you see here, modeling, rigging, animation, FX, and rendering. So it's probably on the modeling menu by default, and that's mostly what we're going to be doing at the beginning. Um, but when you start working on um, rigging functions and animation functions, you'll be switching these menu sets. So watch what happens um, with this menu after Windows it changes. So if I change to rigging, now I've got this skeleton, skin, deform, constrain. If I change to animation, I've got playback, audio, visualize, yada yada. And then I'll change back to modeling. I've got mesh, edit mesh. This is super fun that they've got four menus called mesh something. Um, I always get tripped up in these and it's I guarantee you it'll happen, but um, at any rate <laughs> uh, these are the modeling menus. Every set is um, grouped together according to their functions. They do that because there are too many menus and too many functions in Maya to put it all on the screen at once. So if they had all the menus up at the same time, it would go beyond the edge of most screens, unless you have a wildly high resolution. Uh, the status line contains hotkeys for menu items such as um, object input and snapping. So uh, that is right here. These are snapping. These are object selection. It'll be on object selection by default. Um, this one is component selection. This one is hierarchy selection. We're going to talk about all this stuff. Just leave it at the defaults right now. Don't turn on any snapping yet. Um, the shelf, I mentioned that briefly. The shelf has a uh, new number of shortcuts that you can use to easily create primitives, do some of the basic tools. It's a convenience, like I said. Um, the other thing about it is that it's customizable. Um, you can put your own commands in here. Um, if you want to get into programming, uh, you can actually program Maya to do some some of its own stuff, uh, some some of your own stuff, I should say. Uh, the panel toolbar is below the panel menu in each view panel. Lets you access most of the frequently used items in the um, in the panel menu, and that is that is this toolbar right here. So, similar to the menus up here, uh, you'll have one of these for each toolbar. Uh, and 
the different workspace layouts are right here. We're on single perspective view right now. Uh, if you go to a four panel layout, which gives you a top, front, side, and then the perspective view here, you'll notice that now we've got four panel menus. So um, each of those, any, any number of panels, however many panels you have, you're going to have a menu for that. So, and then you can click on that to get back to the initial view. Uh, layers are down here. Maya has a few different types of layers. Um, display layers to manage a scene. Render layers to set up render passes for compositing and animation. Layers to blend, lock, or mute multiple levels of animation. Channel box lets you keyframe and edit attributes. That's right here. Uh, this will be according to context, so it will be according to what you have selected. So I've got a sphere selected now. The channel box um, shows me the uh, attributes for the sphere. And if I make my selection something different, I get, I get the uh, attributes for that now. So, so that is according to what you have selected. Uh, the QWERTY toolbox is so-called because you can use the QWERTY keys to select, move, rotate, scale, and show manipulators. So that's Q, W, E, R, and I would not uh, turn off manipulators. That can be a little confusing. Um, so that's the key. It turns off the, the manipulators. Um, but... So that's the show manipulator tool. It's easier just to usually use the, the manipulators. So uh, more on that as we go along. OK, um, and then there's the quick layout buttons, the panel views that I mentioned before. These are the, the defaults that you see right here. Um, and you can change these around as much as you want. So. This bottom one toggles the outliner on and off, no matter which view you're in. And you're going to be using the outliner a lot, so you can turn that on if you want to. I'm going to leave it off for the moment, uh, but we are going to get into the outliner. That's one of the most important things in Maya. Uh, the help line is at the very bottom, and I don't know if you've noticed, but um, it gives you a little tip for what whatever you're pointing at. So right now I'm pointing at the helpline, and the helpline displays short help tips for your tools and selections. So as you can see, it's going to give you a little piece of information on it. And if you hover over it for a split second, it will give you a quick look at, at whatever whatever it is you're hovering over. The time slider is for animation, right here. Uh, this is for uh, the time range. Um, well, actually, this is technically the time slider. Uh, this shows the timeline of your animation. It's shown in frames. Uh, we don't actually get anything really moving until later in the semester, but uh, this is how you see your animation actually move and you can determine which range of frames you're looking at with this gray slider this is the time range slider so it can start at frame one and it can just go all the way to the end if you want see how i click that little gray box the lighter gray box right there or you can show a range one through 117 and it doesn't have to start at one so you can show any range in the animation that you want to. Uh, these different buttons will show you how to uh, play, rewind. You can you can play forward and play backward. Uh, you'll notice that the the playback head is going insane if you press play. Um, that's probably going to happen on your computer as well. If uh, we'll get to that, it's if you press play by default. It just basically spits out every frame as fast as it's able to, 
it doesn't wait for the actual timing that you have set so your preview could play at any given frame rate. Uh, why would you want to do that? Well, uh, you'll find out when you get into particles and effects. Those are generated by frame, so when you play back, you got to have it on frame by frame. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to go into the settings and change that to real-time playback. Okay, so animation or er, anim slash character. That is that should be right here. Maybe they changed it. Okay, it's this right here. Um, this is the animation or character menu. It lets you switch the animation layer and the current character set. Uh, and the workspace is the is where you work on your scene. So this is the workspace. It has multiple panels, not always, but um, sometimes it has multiple panels. Like if we look at the four view, and it can show you uh, top, front, side, and perspective. The top and front and side are what are called orthographic views. They're a two-dimensional projection. So we're looking straight down on the on the scene here on the from the top and there's no there's no dimension to it like like this donut will not change size if it's closer to us or further away it will always be this size now it will overlap the things that it's in front of but it will not it will not appear larger as it gets closer to the camera as opposed to the perspective view where it will appear larger if it gets closer to the camera if I can if I can uh, grab it right let me grab it in the there we go so that's the one of the key differences of the uh, orthographic views and the uh, perspective view or a 3d rendered view um, the orthographic views again they're they're flattened two-dimensional projections. So I don't expect you to know every little bit of the Maya interface, but you will be expected to learn and navigate the Maya interface efficiently and create lovely 3D masterpieces. So I'm going to do new scene to clear this out. Don't save. Or maybe you've got a wonderful amazing masterpiece so in which case save it so uh, I'm going to go to Windows settings preferences and I'm just gonna set a few preferences so I want everybody to have these same preferences that I use and uh, these are to help you so Here's the UI visibility from earlier. You can turn it on and off here as well. So um, I know that's in the in the preferences as well. So most of this stuff we're going to leave at default, uh, at least for the time being. Um, animation manipulators is fine. Nerbs, polygons. You don't need to worry about any of that. The near and far clip on your camera sometimes can throw some students for a loop. I'm going to take the near clip down to 0 .001, and I'm not going to set the far clip any higher, but if you have a scene like in outer space that goes beyond 10,000 units away, um, you won't see anything past the 10,000 units on your um, on your workspace. Now you will see it when it renders. So um, it's not that it's not there. It's just that it's not gonna. It's not gonna show in your workspace because of the far clip. Color management is a really big one, and this is a little weird. Uh, I'm just gonna turn off color management. The best way to handle this is just to turn off color management. But 
I have no idea why this is. You have to turn it off again when you do your renderings. So if you don't do this, it will produce off-color renderings. So um, if you need to do any color management, you can just do it in post. But um, if you're wondering why your renderings are too dark or the wrong color, you probably have color management on and you need to turn it off. Okay, dynamics are fine. Uh, you can choose a default project directory if you want to. Uh, if you click on that, it will take you probably to your document folder, uh, which will look like this on a PC. It'll look a little bit different on a Mac, but it's basically the same folder. Uh, there's nothing wrong with using the, the your document folder if that's what you want to do. I don't really care. Um, what you could also do is you could use an external drive or a um, if you have a cloud drive mounted or a network drive or whatever. Uh, if those don't show up here you can usually click the down arrow and go to my computer or like I said in the other video on OS 10, you can type slash volume slash. I don't know if that'll do anything on PC. I don't think it will. Yeah, it doesn't like it. So um, I'll just make my default folder in the documents folder, um, but you can always change it. So uh, down here, um, that's kind of important. This one's really important. Definitely turn on autosave. Uh, this has saved many students' butts. So if I can't find the right scene in your project folder, I will check your autosave folder. Your autosave folder will have automatically saved scenes if you turn this on, and only if you turn this on. Um, the interval can be whatever you want. Uh, it can be 10 minutes. That's fine. Um, 20 minutes. I wouldn't go real high. I wouldn't go real low either. So. Uh, and then the rest of this, you can just leave all the rest of that at default. Um, let's keep going down here. There was supposed to be, maybe it's time slider. I'm looking for that, that frames per second thing that I was talking about earlier. Uh, we're going to display the grid in most cases, pretty much all cases. And you can change the grid units, uh, and I will talk about that in a minute. Rendering, we need to change the rendering preferences. In um, Maya uh, 28, 17, 18, I don't know, they switched from Mental Ray to Arnold. Arnold is lovely. Um, it eats up a lot of render time, but it makes gorgeous renders. So uh, that's always the price you pay. But at any rate, we are not going to be using the Arnold renderer as our default renderer. I'm not saying you can't use it. Um, what I'm saying is you don't want that as your default. When you go to this tab where it says Preferred Renderer, click on Arnold Renderer and change that to Maya Software. Okay, so Maya Software. I'm pretty sure all the selection stuff is fine. Snapping is fine the way it is. Sound is fine the way it is time slider. Okay, so frame rate is going to be 24 frames a second. But like I said, the playback in the viewport, not your render, the viewport will be at whatever speed it can spit the images out. And uh, in, in most cases, until you get really epic six trillion polygon scenes, that's going to be much faster than 24 frames per second. Once you start getting more complex, it starts slowing down, starts going the other way, and dropping frames. Uh, we don't want either of those things to happen for the most part, so if I put uh, uh, some object in the scene, doesn't matter what, and give it a one second movement or close to one second, I'll set a keyframe there. Don't worry about doing this, I'm just making a, an example here and then I'll set a keyframe here. So what's going to happen while it's on play every frame is this should take one second. It's going to take 
a lot less than a second. It's just going to go bananas. So uh, take that playback speed and change it to 24 FPS to get the actual correct playback speed. Uh, and again, why would you ever not want this? Uh, the answer is in particles and special effects. They are generated on a frame by frame basis. So you have to let every frame play out and resolve itself before it goes to the next frame, no matter what the speed is, because uh, it's got to generate those particles on a frame basis. Um, so undo, you're going to want that on, I suppose, an infinite. It doesn't really actually matter because um, you're not going to be using a whole lot of undo, but um, it probably will make you feel more comfortable. Uh, but we'll be using history and not undo. So these are probably fine, and this is all probably fine. Uh, I'm going to set some keyboard preferences as well, but I'm going to do that in a different video at a later time. So we'll come back to that later. Okay, so <clears throat> with all that set, um, I'm going to start talking about 3D coordinates. The most basic entity of the three-dimensional space is the point. Uh, the point has a location with no size, no volume, no height or width. Uh, points will come in the form of vertices for polygons or um, control vertices for NURBS. So any space in the 3D uh, universe is described as X, Y, and Z. So every point will have an x, y, and z coordinate. The numbers give us a 3D coordinate in space, starting from an origin. Uh, the origin is where the grid lines cross, the, the two boulder grid lines. So that is, right at that point, right there, is 0, 0, 0, x, y, z. y is the up direction see over here in the um, channel box as I change the Y it moves up and down Z is the forward direction it moves toward or away from the viewer and X is side to side and you can see that these are all color coordinated X Y and Z according to um, color, so red, green, and blue, X, Y, Z. You can use these little squares on the side to grab two axes at once. Those are called axes. So I could grab the Y and X axis at the same time with this square. And you can see over here in the channel box, my Y and X are changing simultaneously and I can grab the Y and Z with this one, and I can grab the Z and X with this one. If I click in the middle and just start moving stuff, it will move all three at the same time. This is a trap. This is something that you will likely, nah, I'm not gonna say necessarily likely, but you definitely have the potential to shoot yourself in the foot by just grabbing the all three axes and moving them because you don't know in relation to your viewpoint how far away it's moving or towards. So I should just be moving two axes at a time in most cases, pretty much all cases that I can think of, especially early on. Or one, one or two. You can also just type the numbers in here and these units are arbitrary. It doesn't matter what you want to think of them as. You can, I'm going to set this back on the origin point right where it starts. That'll be 0, 0, 0, so now it's back on the origin. So you could call these units meters if you wanted to. I'm going to use it, uh, I'm going to set this to um, negative 5 on the x and that'll move it to the left, 2 on the Y, and that'll move it up 2 units, or 2 meters if you like. And 
negative 1 on the z, and that'll move it back. So when we're talking about these, I won't likely use the phrase back and forth, left and right, or up and down, because they're all arbitrary. I'll use x, y, and z so that we understand where in space we're trying to go. The Maya workspace is where you will conduct most of your work in Maya. It has, we're going to just use the perspective view for the moment, um, it has a panel menu as you saw and some shortcuts here. It has this grid and it has this little coordinate. As you rotate the grid, you will see that it's rotating from coordinates. That is the axial orientation indicator. So it's rotating how the axes are oriented in relation to how you're looking at the perspective view. And then down here you can see which view type you're on. So it's going to say persp for perspective or top, front, and side or whatever. Maya makes a distinction between tools and actions. Tools work continuously. Any clicks or drags you make while the tool is active apply the tool. For example, the selection arrow is a tool. I'm selecting different things every time I click. So any click or drag in the view window while on the selection arrow is while the selection arrow is active performs a selection. Actions are immediate one-shot operations applied to the currently active selection. Most items in the menus are selection, uh, I'm sorry, actions. Almost all menu items are actions, however there are some tools in the menus. These are most of the toolbox right here. You can tell which menu items are a tool if it has the word tool in it or if you select the tool when you select the tool it shows up in the toolbox or if instructions appear on the helpline when the tool is active so this is an example of a tool it'll usually have the word tool in it if it doesn't have the word tool in it then basically when you click it it's going to apply whatever action so let's actually make something let's make a polygon primitive object we're going to use create polygon primitives under the create menu here and go to sphere and notice the state of the interactive creation uh, toggle right now is off by default. That means that when you click sphere it will just pop a default sphere right on the origin point. If you turn that interactive creation on then you can create objects interactively and I'll show you what I mean. I'll turn on interactive creation and then it's going to have me drag it out. So now if I click create sphere with, oops, sorry, if I click create polygon primitive sphere with interactive creation on, you can see right there, I will instead be prompted to drag on the grid. So it won't put it automatically on the origin, It'll put it wherever I start dragging, and it won't be the default size. It'll be whatever size I drag it out to. So that's the basic difference between interactive creation on or off. So keep that in mind according to how you want to do it. And that's going to do the same thing with the shelf. So if I use 
interactive creation on the shelf, then it's going to do this. Um, not all of them work in one click, as you just saw. So a cylinder, you click to um, define the radius of the cylinder and drag, and then you do another click and drag to define the height of the cylinder. You can create primitive objects numerically with these settings turned off. If you want to change the settings, um, such as divisions or size, you're going to use the option box. Uh, we're going to refer to the option box quite often. So if I choose any of these, create polygon, um, cube, next to that is the option box, all these little squares here. Almost everything in the menu has one. Not every, not absolutely everything, but almost everything. So if I go to uh, cube option box, then it's going to bring up a dialog window with some different options. Uh, the first thing I can do is set height, width, and size. So I can give it a height of a width of two, a height of four, and a depth of one. And I can also create more divisions. Um, to define that polygon. If it's one by one by one, then it will just create one polygon on each side. So if I create more divisions, then um, I'll do double four, eight, two. Then it'll make a um, polygon cube with as you can see, more on its side. Since my interactive creation was turned on, it doesn't let me just create it. So if I go back to Polygon and turn off interact cra Interactive Creation, and then I'll go back to my option box, which actually I don't have to click on it again. It just it stays open. Then my option box looks just a little bit different. It just has the create, apply, and close here. So um, that's another difference between interactive creation <coughs> being on or off. Uh, so if I do the same thing and then click create or apply, it will pop that box into the scene. By the way, the only difference between the create and the apply buttons on the option box, apply keeps the option window open. If you click create, it does the exact same thing, but it closes the option box. That's the only difference. So, so how do you select your objects once they're created? You use the selection tool. That's pretty much the easiest way, the Q in the QWERTY toolbox. If you click on one object or another with the selection tool, you will notice that the outline turns green. So that is the indication that it is selected, and the outline is also showing where the polygon faces are. We call that topology. Um, Selection of objects and components is a way of indicating to Maya that this particular item will be affected by the tool or action that you will choose. So whatever thing that you're going to do is going to be applied to what you have selected. As you work with Maya, you will be selecting and deselecting items a lot. Uh, to select multiple items, you can shift-click, and each one you shift-click on will add to the selection. You can also drag out a box to select however many you want to select. You can control-click to subtract from the selection.
So, and actually, shift click will if you. It won't just add to the selection. If you have something already selected and you shift click on it, it will take that away. So if you want to unconditionally add, so that no matter what, once it's added, it won't it won't deselect it. You can hold Control Shift click, and you'll get the little plus next to your mouse. And then with just the control, it's subtracting from the selection. To select components, you can right click and you can see the different components that are available. Edge, vertex, face, um, these are basically the important ones. The um, face means the same thing as polygons, so you can see this is with the components uh, faces selected and it grabs one polygon at a time. With vertex selected it grabs the points that make up the edges of the polygons and then with edges it grabs the edges. So you can, I'm just showing you this to, so you can see how the um, how the component mode affects this stuff. Uh, we're not going to use it really to any great detail for the first couple of assignments here, but um, that's what the components are. The components on NURBS are a little different, but they kind of do sort of the same thing. So if I were to create a NURBS sphere and right click on it, I've got isoparm, control vertex, those are really the two important ones. So the control vertex are those points. And the isoparms are the lines, but it's a little confusing um, how to start using them right out of the gates. We'll get into that later. <clears throat> Object mode and component mode are also displayed up in your status line up here and you can tell the difference by um, you can tell what you've got selected or what mode you're in by the color that it's displaying. So a green outline means you're in object mode. A blue or purple outline means you're in component mode. So you'll see um, these, I guess it's kind of a cyan and sometimes purple components. And anytime you want to change that, you can do, um, like I said, right click. You can go up here to the status line the other thing that you can do is F8. I recommend learning the F8 key to switch between component and object mode because uh, it's really handy to just jump back to object mode. So next up is soft selection which allows you to perform a weighted selection of components, usually vertices, using the soft selection tool. And then you can um, do a transform or whatever kind of change you want to do. This is going to result in a selection that progressively falls away from your primary selection. Um, transforming a soft selected region results in a smooth progression between the transformed components and untransformed components. Uh, this is a good way to create your um, terrain for your scene that you're going to make for uh, for project one. So if I go to polygon, um, I'll do a create polygon primitives. Um, I'm going to do a plane option box. Try not to cover off the selection here. I've got interactive creation turned off. So plain option box and I'm going to give it uh, one unit of height and width is not very big. I'm going to give it at least 20 to start with and um, divisions probably we're going to need let's say 40 because you need 
a lot of vertices there to be able to um, do these kind of soft selections and make it look like a believable um, slope as opposed to polygonal, you know. So um, <clears throat> I'll go, I'll right click on it and go to vertex mode. And what I'm going to do is I want to get into my selection options. Um, so it's just like the option box, but for these things over here. To get to that, you just double click on whichever one you want to get into. In this case, it's the selection tool. And double clicking it will bring up the tool settings. Kind of just like I said, just basically the same thing as the option box. And um, we can collapse the common selection options and go down to soft select here. And then basically, um, probably all you have to do is turn it on depending on your scale. Uh, if you're not seeing this, you have some difference in scale. So it's either bigger or smaller than mine is. Um, in that case, you can change the fall off radius to something bigger um, or try something smaller if that's not working. Uh, but about somewhere around five, a little bigger, a little smaller will work. And what you can do with these is um, we can close the options now and just make a selection of any given point, turn on your move tool and start kind of just sculpting the terrain. So, and it doesn't have to be just one point that you select either. You can, you can go ahead and make a marquee selection of multiple points and get kind of a ridge going. So, um, I'm going to take the edges here and pull those up a little bit. This is just kind of me fiddling around. So, a lot of times it's a good idea to set the edges to something that will cover up any seams um, so that you don't see the edges of the ground plane. So that might mean moving them up or down or whatever, putting something in front of it to obscure it. <coughs> uh, so that can be a great way to sculpt your ground plane. It makes a really good snowy hill type of terrain as you can see. So if you want to make a snowman, it's perfect for that, but it works for pretty much whatever you want to do. I, I went a little extreme here, but, um, you know, you can, you can kind of go from there. What is important here is to remember to double-click on the Move tool again. Uh, I'm sorry, the Selection tool, and go back into Soft Select and turn it off. Um, if you see that, that sort of color, that coloration gradually falling away from your selection, that means you've got soft select turned on and it, uh, it sometimes can um, take you by surprise. So it's double click the selection tool and go to soft selection and unclick soft select. And then you're back to your regular old select one vertex at a time. So it does make the uh, if you try to sculpt terrain like that, it's going to be a little wacky, so... <clears throat> uh, some numerical information is going to be appearing in the channel box over here. Uh, if you're in component mode, you will have a selection of, for example, possibly um, vertices. And this gives my x, y, z coordinates of all the vertices that I have selected. If I press F8 and go back to object mode, I get the what we saw before, the uh, attributes for the object as a whole. Like I said, this is all contextual. It is according to what you have selected and what you are currently doing. <clears throat> Maya is built around nodes. 
uh, nodes are little pieces of history that string together to create your object in its current state. An object such as a sphere is built from several nodes, a creation node that records the options that created the sphere, a transform node that records how the object is moved or what its position is, rotation and scale, and a shape node that stores the position of the sphere's control points. An attribute is a position associated with a node that can hold a value or a connection to another node. For example, a transform node has an attribute for the amount of rotation in the x, y, and z axis. You can set attributes for practically any aspect of your animation, any piece of data in your scene, you can set an attribute for and manipulate it. Uh, there are many ways to set attributes in Maya, like right here in the channel box. The other tab over here called Attribute Editor is going to show you um, everything that the channel box shows you is in the Attribute Editor. Uh, but much more detail. So this will show you the node hierarchy of whatever you have selected as well as its translate, rotate, and scale. That's what we would have seen in the channel box there. So those are all there. Um, its creation stats, anything that might have been set at creation. Like I said, it's a lot more detailed. So um, without getting into too much more than that, uh, the construction history is going to be built in Maya as you work. Most of your actions create nodes <clears throat> in the construction hi history of each object. As you work, um, each point in your work, the current scene is the result of all the nodes that you've created so far strung together in sequence. For example, you can create a curve around a center point to create a new surface with a cross section that has a sh the shape of the curve. When you apply this action to the curve, a new revolve node is created. This new node has the shape of the curve as an input. This chain of nodes from the curve to the revolve node to the surface is called the surface's construction history. Let's see if I can So here's the node editor for plane 1. There's a few different ways to view that. One is the one I just showed you, and the other one I think is General Editor's Connection Editor. Nope, wrong spot. Don't feel bad. It's that's what I'm looking for, hypergraph connections. Don't feel bad. It's, it's, it's a crazy dense program. It's just insane. Um, Windows General Editor's hypergraph connections. So this will show you uh, another view of the same thing. Um, the plane is just the plane. That's, that's all there is to it. And then it shows some other nodes in the scene and you can see how they how each one connects to another. Uh, all this means right now is um, just kind of be aware of it and know that this is happening as you create your scene. Uh, this this kind of becomes the undo as you continue to work. If you if you screwed something up you go back to a previous node and change its attributes. You don't generally undo all the work that you've done since then. So that's what I was talking about earlier with undo. You don't really need it. Um, but I'm sure you'll probably use it in reality. Uh, just 
a couple words on basic surface attributes and then we'll call it good. Um, the surface attributes that we're going to set for this first assignment are just going to be really bare bones. Basically just enough to color the, the objects is all you need. So um, we're not going to get too in depth. Um, you can experiment if you want to. Uh, if you go too far off the beaten path and get yourself into trouble, um, that's pretty much your problem. So if you stick to the basics, you won't have a problem. So right click on the object that you want to assign a surface to and go down to assign new material. And this will bring up the new material dialog box and what we're going to do is we're just going to use um, I have a much more abbreviated list than what I had at LCC when I was making these but um, that's okay yours might be more but anyway I'll just stick to that for the moment that's all we need um, basically you can use Blin, Lambert, and Fong, or Fong E. Fong and Fong E are both very close to the same thing. Fong E is a tad simplified. And I would just stick to those four. The um, Blin surface is good for metals. Uh, the Fong surface is good for shiny objects, things like porcelain and hard plastic. Uh, and the Lambert surface is good for flat matte surfaces that are either porous or like chalk or uh, whatever they just don't reflect as much light as blin or fong so um, I'll just I'll do fong for this one and this little attribute editor pops up this is our C, uh, this is our material with fong and it is going to be listed just as fong one um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a quick sidetrack and talk about naming stuff real quick. So this is going to come up as Fong1. I'm going to name it Snow so that I know I've got the material. Snow is a lot more meaningful than Fong1. This is going to become a very big deal as your scenes get big and epic and amazing. So. A uh, bunch of, like, you're going to have 6,000 Fong 1s if you're lazy about this. Well, they won't all be Fong 1. They'll be Fong 1 through 6,000. And it's going to be useless. Probably probably 5,000 of them are going to be unnecessary duplicates because you were lazy about your housekeeping. So if you name it what it is and something that you can make sense out of, um, you're much better off. And that doesn't just apply to materials, it also applies to your objects. So under the outliner, I'm going to rename plane 1. I'm going to rename that to ground. So every object you create um, will show up in the outliner. You can rename it there. You can also rename it in the uh, channel box. If it's selected, it will pop open in the channel box. You can click on where it says plane one and rename that ground. Stick to alphanumeric only, A through Z, uh, one through zero, and underscore. I would not try to use any other characters in your naming conventions, although again Maya is more forgiving than it used to be. If you click a character it doesn't like, I think more often than not it just changes it to an underscore or something like that, so um, it won't it won't bite you as much as it used to, but it will still bite, so um, just follow best practices and um, keep your house cleaning together you should do okay. So um, I'm going to get back to get back to that uh, surface I was working on. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it. Uh, I'm going to show the um, I'm going to show the hypershade window. If you go to Window, Rendering Editors, Hypershade, 
this will pop open all of your existing materials and you can edit them within there so here's my snow material that I made earlier and there's going to be a few others that are there by default um, we're not going to mess with any of those Let's just leave them where they are don't don't change them so all I need to change for the snow for for the purposes of this assignment is the color so I'm just going to make it white and that's that's really all there is to that so um, don't leave anything with the default surface on it that's called Lambert 1 you want to apply the new material to every object that you make um, don't make snow don't make a snow material five different times once you've got the material existing and you're gonna make your snowball that's gonna be the bottom of your snowman you don't make the snow material again you right click on it and you go down to assign existing material and you just put snow on that so um, and then needless to say when you make your tree we'll do the tree trunk here now we don't have a we don't have a bark texture yet so now I'm gonna assign new material and uh, bark is is pretty flat it is not shiny so we'll do Lambert and it usually pops right up on the material but if it doesn't you can usually find it in the nodes here in in these tabs on the attribute editor or again Windows rendering editor hypershade so and that will come up as Lambert too because I haven't named it yet so I'll call that bark and that's going to be a brown coloration and something I want to impress upon you um, as I'm doing these demos throughout the semester uh, I am not in any way saying that this is pretty what I am showing you is the tools you need to make your scene okay so um, you should be able to make something prettier than this and the other thing that I want you to be really careful about is how you compose the shot so this if I render this right now um, I'll click the render button the problem with this is that I can see this all this blackness around the edge so um, it really destroys the illusion that we're trying to create here so uh, you gotta change the way your um, your camera is positioned uh, that's one of the things that you're gonna have to do um, it's still gonna have blackness back here because there's nothing there though so um, this is not a nighttime scene probably or even if it is you're gonna have something there so uh, what I want to do is put a backdrop of some type back there and that can be uh, especially this early on that can just be as simple as a plane um, I'll just make a plane I'm gonna rotate it move it back and then it's gonna get blown way up real big to make sure it covers everything here and uh, I will right click and assign new material uh, this is gonna be Lambert and I'm going to call this sky. The color will be just a, that's a little neon. I'm going to tone that down a bit. Please don't reach for the top shelf colors every single time. You can tone it down a bit and use the top shelf colors for emphasis. one of the problems that a lot of new designers have is going right for the hundred percent saturation colors right out of the gates and it's like save the save the high saturation colors for emphasis make most of your scene lower saturation so you can pump it up on the areas that you want people to look at so now when I render this there will be 
no blackness showing. And that's all a matter of how you create your objects uh, and how you position your camera. So you want to make sure that you've got no blackness showing from behind. So uh, that's it. Uh, that is everything you need to know to create your first scene. Uh, and don't forget to save. Oh, and there is, okay, there is one more thing that I do want to mention, is that when you're saving your scene, and um, I haven't set my project yet, but it is set to the default project, uh, this will not alter your grade, but this can help with crashes sometimes. Um, save it as a Maya ASCII instead of Maya binary when you're saving. So that makes it so that if it does crash Maya, um, there's a chance, it's not a guarantee, but uh, I can at least open it up with Notepad and see if, if I can find the problem and um, fix it in text. If it's Maya binary, I cannot do that. If you do save it as an MB file, it's fine. Um, it's just that if you have a technical problem, sometimes that can prevent me from being able to fix it. So I do recommend Maya ASCII. It's a recommendation, not a requirement. Okay, that's it. Have fun with your first assignment.